Let's continue now with the next section of Revelation, Revelation chapters 6 through 8. So just to get our overall viewpoint and make sure that we have context here, let's recognize again the overall structure of Revelation. And let's recognize that we have just finished the introduction or the prologue to the book. So here was the very highly oversimplified outline I gave you before. The introduction, chapters 1 to 5, and that could be broken up a little differently, but that basic framework, chapter 1 giving us the prologue, chapters 2 through 3, the letters to the churches, chapters 4 and 5, an introduction to the throne room of heaven, the one who's sitting on the throne, chapter 4, the lamb who takes the book, chapter 5. And I, I understand that is essentially beginning the book, getting us started on this vision of the book. Then the middle section of the book, chapters 6 to 18, the judgments of the Lamb. And that section now is showing us how Jesus Christ is bringing about judgment upon the earth, loving judgment. He's drawing people to himself, even as he is seriously judging sin. And those pieces together in the middle section of the book. And then the conclusion, this is the grand ending. This is Jesus returning. This is the millennium. This is the new heavens and the new earth and all the richness of that. Now, there is a more complex outline that I have also created. And this might be a little overwhelming. Let me uh, explain to you first what's going on between these two screens. Do you see how here you have three layers or three levels? So level one, chapters one to five, that's the top row right? And the middle row, the central section of the book, the bottom row, the conclusion of the book. What I did is I just took these pieces and I broke them up. And so now you see the top row, that's chapters one to five. That's just like here, chapters one to five here, chapters one to five. Same thing on the next row. Look at that, chapter six to seven, all the way out to the end, chapter 17 and 18. Okay, go back uh, uh, a screen and you can see here chapter six to 18. It's the same. And all I'm doing is breaking these out. Let me show you then what we're looking at for this section right now. In this section, what we will consider are the beginning of the judgments. Specifically now, we're going to see the seven seal judgments and the beginning of the trumpet judgments. That's the section that we're considering here, chapter six through eight, the seven seal judgments and the beginning of the trumpet judgments. And where you see this orange here, you're seeing those judgments repeated. So here are the seven seal judgments. Here are the seven trumpet judgments. Here are the seven bowl judgments. We'll talk about the relationship between them, them. but these are parallel series of judgments that happen in filling out this middle section. Each one of these sections, part of the judgments of the lamb that he is bringing upon planet earth for its rebellion against him. Now that's an attempt to understand how this fits into the overall flow of the book and how we put some of the pieces of the book together. Let me start then in terms of specifics. Let's go to chapter six and I just I want to talk to you for a second or two about how we even interpret some of these judgments to begin with. So what do these things mean? When I read some of these dramatic judgments, what exactly is that referring to? What does it describe? What even is the symbolism or the underlying meaning of it? That's a common question. And if we look at some of the statements in here, some of the statements could seem impossible to understand in literal terms or maybe just overwhelming. So let's just look down through. You see here, uh, a horse coming and he went forth conquering to conquer. You see another horse coming and there's war and they're going to kill each other. And, and then the third here, I beheld a black horse and he has a pair of balances in his hand. And in the midst of the four beasts, a measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley for a penny, see that thou hurt not the oil and the wine. What is this referring to? And you're right if as you read these horses, you understand that there's some symbolism here. In fact, there's a biblical reason for the symbolism here. These are going back to previous Old Testament symbols that were used 
And so there's linkage between the Old Testament and the New Testament here that makes it clear that these horses are not, these are not actual horses that you're going to be sitting on earth somewhere and you're going to see a, a, a physical horse come galloping by. This is a symbol for here comes a judgment. In fact, this even should be obvious enough. This has become a symbol, just broadly speaking, horsemen is bringing judgment. Okay? or bringing, uh, bringing a plague, or bringing some kind of catastrophe. That's all that's meant in that. However, pay attention then to the specifics of what he's describing. A pair of balances in his hand, that's going to be used like in commerce, uh, trade. And you can see here a measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley for a penny. In our language, we hear penny and we think not much money. Uh, what he's actually talking about, or what these words actually mean, a penny, it's a denarius, which is a day's labor. And so you think of how much money you make if you work all day, hard work, a solid day's work for a laboring man, okay? One day's labor for a measure of wheat. The problem with this is that a measure of wheat is roughly about what one man needs to eat, that, that's the calorie content that a person needs to take in. In other words, uh, part of the, the, the basic framework of things working is if one man is providing for a family or if one person is providing for several others, he has to be able to make enough money to provide for more than himself. And what we're talking about here is extreme economic hardship. Okay, it's just describing famine and economic hardship on the level that nobody can purchase what they need to get. That last expression that's in there might be confusing because it says, do not harm the oil and the wine. The idea of this probably goes, the luxuries are still cheap or the luxuries remain. Why? Nobody can afford to buy luxuries. The luxury items sit on the shelf, but the basic food stuff is now hard to purchase. And that's disaster. If you keep on going, you get a little further down in the chapter and you discover that a fourth part of the earth is to be killed. 25% of the population of planet earth. I mean, as of right now, when I'm recording this, we're talking about almost 2 billion people gone. This is extraordinary. And this kind of destruction, this kind of horror has never happened before. This is truly unprecedented. This has not happened in the past. So we're talking about horrible destruction. You can get a little bit further in the description here down in verse 12. And uh, the vision now records that actually the sun is going to be blackened out and the moon will become as blood. Um, if you've ever seen uh, like an eclipse, then when the sun is darkened, yes, the moon looks red, looks like blood. The stars of heaven fell upon the earth. Uh, we're probably talking here then about... Um, we're, t we're talking about uh, things coming into the orb orbit of earth. And so you're, you're going to see destruction coming that way. Okay, so what are we looking at here? Total unprecedented, unprecedented, dented, horrible destruction, awful destruction on planet Earth. And what we should then process this with hearing this. Yes, there are elements of symbolism here. The horses are obviously symbolic. They're obviously representing something more. But as you read then the descriptions, it's not hard to recognize Basically, what the passage describes is what's going to happen. I, I look no further. I don't try to find, so the sun will be darkened. What does that really mean? It means the sun will be darkened. One fourth of people will die. What does that, what spiritual reality does that refer to? It refers to one fourth of the people dying. It's shocking, shocking and it's horrifying. Now, there's another thing you should know about the judgments that's fascinating, and we will return to this point later on, but the judgments are, I'll use the word telescoping. What I mean by that is each one of the judgments builds on the previous set of judgments. And as I said, I'll return to this, but let me just show you what I mean and then show it to you from Scripture. So the concept I'm using here, I said earlier we have these three sets of judgments, we have the seven seals judgment, we have the seven trumpets, and we have the seven bowls. 
Okay, so these three core judgments happen in this central section. The question we're trying to solve here or understand is how do those judgments relate to each other? And in order to understand that, we can put it in these terms, the judgments actually open up into each other. And what I mean by that is you will have the seals, one, two, three, four, five, six. When you get to the seventh seal, the seventh seal contains the next set of seals. The seventh seal opens up into the next following set of seals. And you go through the seven set of, or excuse me, seven trumpets. When you go through the seven trumpets, the seventh trumpet opens up and it opens up into the seven bowls. So it's as though these are, let's say, these are containers. Each one contains judgments. And so you open up the judgments and you get to the last judgment. When you open up the judgment, you look inside and you discover, oh, an entirely new set of judgments inside. Let's start over. And you begin again with another set of seven. And at the end of that last, you get to the last judgment. Here are seven more. That's the framework that that is happening with these judgments. One other piece you ought to know that I'm, I want us to understand and talk about here is to recognize that the judgments are also increasing in intensity. What I mean by that, let's just notice a few things. Um, for instance, how about this? Here we recognize that we have one fourth of all people killed. Okay. Now I get a little further down and I discover that a third of the remaining people are killed. In other words, here, 25 people die. Now, so that leaves 75% of the original. Well, then now another third of that, another 25% of the original, or now 33% are killed. So it's increasing in intensity, or more people are dying in simple terms. Um, we can do this other ways. You see things like this. Um, you see here, a third of the sea is blood. Well, when you get down to the final section of judgments, the sea is totally blood, and eventually all of the water is blood. You have some things here where the sun and the stars are darkened, probably the idea is for a period of time, temporarily. Okay? You get a little further down and you see a third of the sun's light is darkened. But you get down to the end and you end up with total darkness. In other words, there's an increasing intensity as you go. I think you're going to see this and sense this very strongly when you get down to the second set of judgments and you read about these demons coming out like armies. And it's just horrifying. And certainly when you get down to the end, the final battle, and all of this destruction, it is absolutely and utterly horrifying. In other words, I think the point I want to make here is there is an increasing intensity. As you go down through these judgments, they get worse. The judgments get more serious. Why? What's the point? Well, some of that I'm going to hold until a future lecture. Our next lecture, there's an important reason that there is a progression like this. And we can see as we build into our next lecture what we're talking about. Let me show you now one other very important characteristic of these judgments you've got to recognize. And that is where the judgments are coming from. Okay, do you remember Revelation chapter 5, how this all started off? That John saw the one who's sitting on the throne and all of those around him who are worshiping and praising him. So at the end of chapter five, we, or four, we move into chapter five, and chapter five begins this way I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book. The book is sealed with seven seals. And the question goes who is worthy to open the book? I said before, in terms of the book, this book is speaking of God's, probably like God's blueprint or God's plan, what he's going to do in dealing with the earth, how he is going to handle the earth. No one was found open, was found worthy to open and read the book until one of the elders said to me, weep not, the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. He is worthy to open the book. You keep on going, and as then people are praising him, the praise goes, he is worthy to take the book. He is worthy to open the seals. Who is worthy to open the book? Who is worthy to open the seals? The Lamb 
is worthy. All of that is chapter 5. But here, here's what gets so interesting. When you move forward to chapter 6, what do you find? You find immediately that it is the same lamb, and it is the same book, and it is the same seals. Let me show you what I mean. So chapter 6 now. I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals. A bit later, as you keep on going down through the chapter, when he opened the second seal. A bit later in the chapter, when he opened the third seal. A bit later now, he opens the fourth seal. And finally, you discover now this is the pattern all the way down through the rest of this chapter. You're going to find the lamb opening the seals. He's opening these seals, and with every seal he opens, the judgment becomes a little bit clearer. Some of this will be unfamiliar to us because this is not the way our system works. But seals, is this is what you're looking at. They are clay or wax, some kind of form of something soft that can be given an impression. And so someone would have their official seal, they would stamp it into this. And what that means is that by their authority, they have held this paper, this document shut. To open the seals is to communicate that you have the rights to do that. You have the rights to open the book. And, and it's not exactly clear how the seven seals work, except the sense maybe we get is when we say book, don't think book like, like a bound book the way that, that we do books today, uh, a book that you know works something like this. That, that's not the idea of book. The idea of book is a scroll, like what you just saw. And each one of the seals, possibly as you break the seal, it allows you to unroll a little bit more. Break the next seal, you can unroll some more. Break the next seal, you can unroll the next part. We're not sure of that, but that seems to be at least a possibility. The point being then, the judgments that are coming are happening as the book is being opened. And very, very significant. You've got to pay attention to this concept. Who is the one who is opening these seals? Who is the one that stands behind these judgments? You know the answer, but let's see it from Scripture. Here at the beginning of the chapter, it's explicit. When the Lamb opened one of the seals... And then when the rest of the references in the chapter, when he had opened, when he had opened, when he had opened the fourth seal, when he had opened the sixth seal, and in some understandings or readings in chapter 8, this may also say when the lamb had opened the seventh seal. In any case, it's very explicit and obvious who is the one who's opening these seals, who is the one who's sending the judgments. It is none other but the lamb. Now, uh, let me help put some of those pieces back together with some of the things we've talked about before. I strongly emphasized that the point and the theme and the focus of the book of Revelation is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the focus in chapter 1, the vision. Jesus Christ is the one speaking in chapters 2 and 3, the letters to the churches. Chapters 4 and 5 demonstrate God the Father is on the throne. Jesus is equal with him. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. This book is about him. You could be tempted or you could be forgiven for thinking something like, well, then once we get past all of that, we get into the judgment sections. Now the theme of that section is the end times. Or the theme of that section is the judgments that God is sending. But I didn't title that section that way, if you remember. The title I gave for that section and for that part of the outline, I called that the judgments of the Lamb. Who is sending the judgments? The answer is Jesus is sending the judgments. Jesus is opening the seals. And every seal he opens sends another judgment on planet Earth. Jesus is judging Earth. And all of that is an expression of this basic overall theme for the book of Revelation, that Jesus is the theme of this book. The point is the Lamb judging the earth. Now, connect this, though, with another theme that we're going to develop here. And that is the people of God. The people of God have a part 
in all of this. Um, I could demonstrate this in a couple of different places, but I'll just make a passing reference. Do you remember in Daniel 7, we saw that the Son of Man came before the Ancient of Days, all dominion, power, authority was given to him. But then we notice this really interesting pattern. At the end of the chapter, you saw the saints of the Most High, or the people of the Most High, received kingdom and dominion and, a pow and power that they should reign. And you, you have this interesting connection. Wait, I thought the Son of Man received that. Oh, but what what is his people? Who are they? And one of the points that can be made there is that the the victory that Jesus Christ wins is now shared with those who are his people. So there's a connection between Jesus' victory and those who are in Jesus or those who follow Jesus, those who are united with him. But we get a similar pattern that's going to happen here in the book of Revelation. You're going to discover that Along with the judgment of the world, there is now also this group of people, the people of God. And they are in some way, they are being persecuted, but they are in some way part of God's work in judging planet Earth. Let me show you what I mean. Here's chapter 6, and the judgments are happening. Now we come to the fifth seal. And the fifth seal is, he says, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. They cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? White robes were given unto them. It was said that they should rest a little season until their fellow servants, also their brethren, that would be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. So here's the question I want to ask. Why is martyrdom a judgment on planet Earth. In other words, I, okay, if I'm going in context in this chapter, you can see that some of the other judgments that happen here are some of the things we just saw, things like famine, death, uh, a fourth of the, the people on planet Earth killed, just horrible things, war. Why is the fifth seal martyrdom for the believers? Another way of saying this, I thought this was a judgment on planet Earth, not a judgment on God's people. I would assume that God's people somehow escape. So why then is part of the judgment these people crying out? And in fact, together with that description, just notice this, it's not done yet. He says that they should rest yet for a little season. In other words, just wait. I will judge the earth for your blood eventually. But wait, because some of your fellow servants, also some of your brothers, are going to be killed. In other words, what I get in this section, horrifyingly, is that not only is planet earth being judged, but God's people are also suffering. Why are they suffering? Why are they dying? What's happening here? That relates to what happens in chapter 7. So let's take a look at that. In chapter 7, the angel comes or is sent, and he has a mission. The mission of the angel is to put a seal on all of God's people, the one, or excuse me, the 144,000 of God's people. So let me just show you what I mean by that. The angel comes having the seal of the living God, like a mark, like an authenticating mark. We do this sometimes in products, uh, like if you, let's say, if you open, um, you know, certain, like a juice or liquid, then it'll have a seal at the top, and it, it'll say, if seal is broken, do not accept the product. Okay, it's that. So it's a seal that says, this is authentic. This is real, this is fresh. Well, here, the angel is coming having a seal. He's going to put a mark on them, and then it's going to say, this is mine. This belongs to God. This is God's person. And the cry is, hurt not the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. What that's saying then is, stop the judgment. Pause, pause, pause. Okay, wait. We're going to go, we're going to seal all of God's people first, so that it's clear who belongs to him. And one or two comments about this as we go. There's another passage in um, the Pauline epistles, and it says, God knows those who are his. Let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. And the, the underlying reason for that is because God has a seal. 
And the concept of the seal then goes, this proves who is authentically his. His seal confirms this person is mine. This person belongs to me. Another form of this idea, if you know the mark of the beast, when you get a little further out in Revelation, the mark of the beast is a way of saying this person belongs to Satan, the Antichrist, the devil. This is one of his. And in fact, that's an idea that I'll return to later that I want you to remember. Really helpful if you can remember this, that it's not just Satan who has a mark, but it's God's people also have a mark. We, we always talk about the mark of the beast. Let's not forget, there is also a mark of the believer. There's both. That's what's going on here in Revelation. God will mark those who are his. God knows those who are his, and he will mark them as his own. A couple of other details I'd like you to know about this. The 144,000. This idea has been manipulated and misused and twisted badly by certain groups. For instance, Jehovah's Witnesses teach that they are, or certain of them, are the 144,000. Originally, they said that all of their believers or all of their followers were part of the group. And then basically what happened is they ran out of slots. They ran out of uh, available spots for the 144,000. And so today, only a fewer amount, a fewer number of special people are part of that group. Okay, well, let's look at what the passage says about this people, who they are. And what we'll discover is a very interesting pattern. He sealed 144,000, but who is it? Of all the tribes of the children of Israel. And he's going to list the tribes now. Of the tribe of Judah, 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad, 12,000. Asher, 12,000. Naphtali, 12,000. Manasseh, 12,000. Simeon, he lists every tribe, the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. And those 12 tribes are the 144,000. That's them. Okay, so conclusion that you ought to draw. This is not referring to any special symbolic group or something. Who are these people? These are Jews. These are believing Jews. We'll get a little further on and we'll discover more details about them. These are men. Uh, chapter, well, I'll show you the passage. In chapter 14, we discover that they are specifically unmarried men. And there's some details to explain about that. Verse 4 in chapter 14, these are they which are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. That's not to say that to be married is defilement. It is to say that they have not engaged in any kind of immorality, fornication. That would be defilement. And it is also to say that they are unmarried, and that they were people in whose mouth was found no guile, because they followed God faithfully. Okay, so just one or two, a word or two of explanation here to get the idea. It is not that this is a symbolic, the 144,000, is a symbolic reference to some group or something. It is 144,000 actual people, as in you could count them. 12,000 from each tribe. I, I don't know how else to understand that because the passage is so explicit and specific. If this was intended to refer to the church, why list all of the tribes? Why talk about each tribe and they have 12,000 and 12,000 and 12,000 and 12,000? Why would that be a, a way of using the symbolic language? What does it mean? It means 12,000 from each tribe. And there are details that you can sort out that are in your notes talking about some of the complexities of the list of the tribes and how we would even know which tribe is which and so forth. You could read the notes more on that if you're interested. But I do understand this as actual Jewish people. During the time of God's judgment, after Jesus has already come in the rapture, now God's judgment is falling on planet Earth. That's what we're learning about. And during that time, there is this group of people who, by God's grace and by faith in the gospel, are converted. And God sends out evangelists, 144 male, single, celibate evangelists, to go out and spread the gospel everywhere. Why celibate? Why male? Why all of these details? Because of this, if you know that the world is going to end in the next seven years, this is not a time to settle down and start a family. 
If you know that the world is that close to complete destruction, the, the basic response is, we have seven years. We're not going to settle down and have a family. Let's go. Let's spread the gospel. Let's declare and proclaim everything that we can while the time remains. And that's another part of the factor that I'm happy to show you now. In chapter 14, you meet this same 144,000 again. The lamb stood on Mount Zion, with him the 144,000. Wait, where are they? What are they doing? You heard a voice from heaven, the voice of many waters. You heard the voice of harper, harpers, and they sang a new song. And they, they, they sang this song before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. But do you hear what it's saying? They were, chapter 7, sealed on planet earth. Sealed to say, this one belongs to God. This one belongs to God. This one belongs to God. But I get up further here, and now they're in heaven. How does somebody get from earth to heaven? There's only one answer. They were killed. <laughs> What you're discovering now in two different ways, and in a third way we'll discover in chapter 11, is that God is sending messengers to speak for him. God is sending truth to planet earth. They are rebellious. They are rejecting. God sends them truth, and he tells them what's happening. And the response of the earth dwellers, the response of the world to the truth that God sends is that they reject. They hate and reject the truth that he gives. Let me show you a couple of passages that do that. And again, this is a, re a theme that we will return to in future sections to talk about. But here, right at the beginning of chapter 6, this first set of judgments, it's very obvious what people's response is when they see the judgments. They call to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the laugh, wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? This is in the context of those sealed judgments, what we're studying in chapter 6. And, and the conclusion people have is that they turn away from God. Now, comment here first. It's possible for us to imagine that when all of these awful judgments are coming, the famine and the pestilence and even later these armies of demons, when all of these horrible things are coming, that the people on earth are sitting down there saying, this is so weird. What's happening? Must be global warming. I mean, how could this possibly all of these catastrophes happen at once? And we imagine that, that the earth dwellers are sitting down there scratching their heads. What went wrong? That's, that's not correct. The people on earth know why things are going wrong. Look at it. Look at their knowledge and their understanding. Hide us from the face of, look how specific this is, him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. The great day of their wrath has come. These people get it. They understand where this judgment is coming from. You get this a little further if you jump ahead to chapter 9. Here's the rest of mankind. They were not, the rest of mankind, the people who survived, did not repent. They did not give up worshiping demons or their idols. They did not repent of their murders or their sexual, sexual immorality or their thefts. We get this further when we jump up to chapter 11. The two witnesses are killed. The people kill them. They gaze at their dead bodies. They rejoice and make merry and exchange presents because the two prophets are finally dead. Hooray! Or last set of passages that do this, chapter 16. They were scorched by the fierce heat. They cursed the name of God. They did not repent. They cursed the God of heaven. They did not repent. They cursed God for the plague of the hail. And the point in all of this is two things. One, the earth dwellers know where this is coming from. They understand why, and they still do not repent. How do we put these pieces together? And here's the framework that we get. How do the earth dwellers know that this came from God? 
How do the earth dwellers know that God is the one judging the world? How do they come up with language like, hide us from the wrath of the one who sits on the throne and from the lamb? How do they come up with things like that? And the answer that we're going to continue developing as we go forward is that God is sending judgments, judgments, judgments on planet earth. You would have to just, you would have to be blind not to see all of the weight and the horror of the judgments he's pouring out. It is absolutely clear that God is sending these judgments. On the other hand, God also sends messengers to interpret. He sends the 144,000. He sends those who we saw in chapter 6 were martyred for their faithfulness. He sends the two witnesses. He keeps on sending and sending and sending explanation. So in one hand, judgment. In the other hand, interpretation. Here's what's happening. And the point of Revelation or the argument of Revelation is even as God gradually increases the judgment and even as he gradually increases the or pours out mercy and gives people interpretation. Look, 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 listen. The world rejects and hates his mercy. Now, we will also see encouraging pictures. We will discover that, yes, there are people who put their faith in God during the tribulation. I would argue that the 144,000 are proof of that. I would argue that they have heard the message and they have been redeemed. They have put their faith in Jesus Christ. They have become believers. Clearly, they're sealed as God's people. And now they're proclaiming the message as faithful believers. There will be people who put their faith in Christ during the tribulation. The argument of Revelation goes, however, that the majority do not. And it's horrifying then to watch God judging and judging and judging the earth, people hearing and hearing and hearing his messengers, and their response to the messengers is, we hate what we're hearing. Let's kill the messengers instead of listening to what God has said. Kill the messengers so that we no longer have to hear. We kill them, we leave their bodies in the streets, we rejoice and send part, gifts to each other and party because finally they're dead. Why? Now at last we don't have to hear the words of God. Conclusion or encouragement for us today as we finish the time, take seriously the word of God you've received. It's insanity when people block their ears, refuse to listen, Reject the clear and beautiful and rich words of God that he's given. It is insanity. Don't do that. Hear the words of God that he's given you. And when you do, you can rejoice in the privilege that you are one of his people. If you will hear and accept his words, you are one of his own. God is a God who gives graciously and mercifully to draw us to himself. Let's hear Let's listen, let's respond. And then as we have opportunity, let's go ourselves and proclaim the message so that other people can hear the message, the good news, the glorious hope that though judgment is coming, there is also mercy for all who will come to him.